as the sun rose over the plain of Marathon, the fate of freedom, of democracy itself, of Western civilization, lay in the hands of a small band of Greeks. This is the plain of Marathon as it appears today, except for the ships and soldiers, different than it was then. Ever since Ionia's revolt against the Persians, when Athens sent 20 ships to her aid, the angry Darius had appointed a slave to exhort him each day. Master, remember the Athenians. The time had come. Let us, in our mind's eye, see in the wheat, Greeks, and in the poppies, the red-plumed Persians. The Athenians charged upon the barbarians and fought in a manner never to be forgotten. There fell in this battle of Marathon, on the side of the barbarians, 6,400 men. On that of the Athenians, 192. The burial place of the 192 is a mound today on the plain of Marathon, marked by a copy of the funeral shaft that once adorned it. But the living heritage these dead left to follow them, as did those who fought off Xerxes, the son of Darius, in the sea battle of Salamis ten years later, has been called one of the most triumphant rebirths of the human spirit in all history. Greece, free in thought, free in speech, equal in law, found herself and entered upon her golden age. An age that was to survive the centuries between to touch us all. This is the goddess Athena considered invisible to those fighting. Where the silver Alpheus flows amidst the sacred grove of Alpheus in Olympia, where horns heralded the Olympic Games after each interval of four years, Greek art marched hand in hand with the living symbols of the Greek spirit. For to this shrine from all the remote corners of the Greek world, men came to contest with each other in peace. They came, these called the first people in the world to play, believing that the body of man had a glory as well as the spirit. Finally, the temple gods honored, the athletes pass under the arch, you pass through now, into the packed and roaring stadium. Like this one, so well preserved at Delphi. Stones still mark the spot where the runner crouched for the sprint. Much as Sophocles described him. He heard the herald's shrill cry summon the runners. He rose in beauty glorious. All the people were hushed in wonder. He ran the race, the victor from first to last, crowned finally with perfect honor.
From such religious games, Greek art drew its inspiration, not only in the Golden Age, but on through the Hellenistic period that followed. The sculptor echoing the athlete. Joining the sculptor, who plays the athlete in stone, was the poet, like Pindar, who sculpted his praise in words. With reins untangled, through the field of twelve fleet courses, he shattered no strength of his gear. Blessed are you, that even after the huge toil, you have remembrance in mighty words. Among forty charioteers who fell, you brought perfect your car through, and with heart unshaken are come home from the shining of the game's prizes to the city of your fathers. Such cities, as often in pride, demolished a portion of their protective wall as token that they need have no fear with such sons as these. So highly regarded the games in the ancient Greek world. This is the holy height that overlooks the city of Athens and bears the name Acropolis. The Persian wars behind them, the Athenians began, under their great leader Pericles, and against the complaints of the other members of the League of Greek States, who protested that the money was meant for their defense, and not to detect Athens like some vain woman hung around with precious stones. The Athenians began to rebuild their shrines. In the doing of it, they left reflected in imperishable stone, wounded true by time and more modern wars, yet still breathing, deep majesty of the art, born of Athenian freedom and intellect. Let us tour the Acropolis with the ancient Greeks who saw it then, Pausanias, Herodotus, Plutarch, following the same path as they who came to the gods from the city below, singing hymns and in procession. The Acropolis has only one entrance. There is no other, for it falls sheer on all sides and has an impregnable wall. The Propylia have a roof of white marble, which in beauty and the size of the slabs has no equal in my time. To the right of the Propylia stands the Temple of the Wingless Victory. And this is the spot from which Aegis, seeing the black sails of his son's ship returning from Crete, which he thought signaled the loss of his son to the jaws of the Minotaur, mistakenly jumped to his death. There is also on the Acropolis a temple of Erechthus called the Earthborn. There 
is an eternal newness which blooms upon these maidens, preserving them from the touch of time, as if they had some perennial spirit and undying vitality mingled in the composition of them. From such quarries as these came the stone with which Greek hands shaped the crowning structures of the Golden Age, including the most famous building in the world, raised under the supervision of Phidias, the home of the goddess Athena, the Parthenon. Thus grew the works up, no less stately in size than exquisite in form the workmen striving to outvie the material and the design with the beauty of their workmanship. They brought pleasure and ornament to the city of Athens and the greatest admiration and even astonishment to all strangers. Yet the most wonderful thing of all was the rapidity of their execution. continued their work unsurpassed even beyond the Golden Age, as if time was sprinting, and the joyous use of it was only for the hasty. Each piece, simple in line, carefully proportioned, rich in nobility, had a harmonious wholeness about it, as if the artist were plumbing the very depths of the subject's personality with his own. What is good is beautiful. What is beautiful is good. And perhaps what is most astonishing of all is that most of the finest works in Greek art were as if by a miracle created in 30 short years between about 480 and 450 BC. Since the gods they honored with their art were as real to them as their friends, religion permeated all aspects of their lives. But in Greek religion, there was no ground more hallowed, no place more sanctified than that set in one of the most striking physical settings in all of Greece. Delphi, home of the oracle whose prophecies time and again literally changed the course of history. Here, under the protection of brooding Mount Parnassus, where two eagles, released by Zeus from opposite ends of the world, were believed to have met and hence determined the center of the earth, all Greek states came with equal rights, came to consult the oracle of Apollo. Here, at the beginning of the sacred way, you take your place. You come perhaps from miles away to seek the advice of the priestess. Continuing up the sacred way, you would have, in the old days, where now lie but fallen stones, enjoyed a myriad of wonders. The treasury of the Corinthians, renowned for their wealth, the chariot of the sun, the great altar of Apollo, and more. But soon you look up to behold in reverence the most sacred spot of all, that place on whose walls was carved the ancient Greek credo. Know thyself. 
nothing in excess. Yes, the temple of Apollo. Against the Athenian Acropolis, and matching the powerful religious stimulus associated with its holy temples, was the religious experience that came from the Greek stage. For the Greeks excelled not only in sculpture and architecture, and government, and philosophy, and science and ethics, but no less in drama. For just as democracy is a Greek word and invention, so is tragedy. You are looking at the site where first were performed during this same incredible 5th century BC, the plays of Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides and Aristophanes. Here to fill the seats, from all parts of Greece they came, on the holiday of Dionysus, god of fertility and wine and song, came to see the plays entered in competition. The theatre is not now as it was then, rather it is from the time of Nero or later. But in such chairs as these sat the Athenian dignitaries, listening to the players and the chanting chorus that came from the stage since ornamented by the Romans. Strange it is to realize, as one looks upon the remnants of this scene, that in the year 480 BC, Aeschylus fought in the Battle of Salamis, Sophocles sang in the chorus that celebrated that victory, and Euripides was born on the day of the battle. Gone are the crowds. Empty are the seats. But still today, in modern Greece, as in the Greece of old, from theatres of that time, echo the words of the Greek playwright. Here, in the best preserved theatre of all, at Epidorus, Greek actors speak the words of Sophocles in his tragedy of Oedipus the King. Self-blinded in revulsion as he stands hopeless before a fate that had him, unbeknownst to himself, kill his father and marry his mother. <laughs> Thus, in ancient Greece, began the tradition that led to Shakespeare. Just as a flower blooms briefly and dies, so the flowering genius of Athens, whose blossom was the splendor of ancient Greece, was soon to end. The beginning of the end came in 431 BC. The two principal city-states of Greece, totalitarian Sparta and democratic Athens, grown rich and overbearing, met in the Peloponnesian War. Here, after the first ruinous year of the Peloponnesian War, here to the public burial ground of the Athenians, one day came Pericles and the people to honor those who had fallen in their city's service. Pericles, of whom it is said, in eloquence no man could equal him. Persuasion sat upon his lips. Alone, among all orators, he cast a spell, wielding a dreadful thunderbolt in his tongue. He looked upon those gathered before him and spoke. Spoke of those whose image we can still see in the immortal frieze that once surrounded the Parthenon, and whose works still speak from its sculptures and pediments. I doubt if all the earth can produce a man who, where he has only himself to depend upon, is equal to so many emergencies. 
and endowed with so happy a versatility as the Athenian. For Athens, alone of her contemporaries, is found when tested to be mightier than her reputation. The admiration of the present and succeeding ages will be ours, since we have not left our greatness without witness, but have shown it by mighty proof and far from needing a Homer or other of his kind, whose verses might charm for the moment only, we have left imperishable monuments behind us. Our government favors the many instead of the few. This is why it is called a democracy. If we look to the laws, they afford equal justice to all. If to social standing, advancement in public life falls to ability, class considerations not being allowed to interfere with merit. We cultivate refinement without extravagance and knowledge without effeminacy. Wealth we employ more for use than for show and place the real disgrace of poverty not in admitting to the fact, but in refusing to struggle against it. Our enemies from their very cradles by a painful discipline seek after manliness. At Athens, we live exactly as we please, and yet are just as ready to encounter every legitimate danger. Such is the Athens for which these men, in the assertion of their resolve not to lose her, nobly fought and died, thus electing to die resisting rather than to live submitting. You, their survivors, must yourselves now realize the power of Athens and feast your eyes upon her from day to day till love of her fills your hearts. And then when all her wonder shall break upon you, you must reflect that it was by courage, sense of duty, and the keen feeling of honor in action that men were enabled to win all this. These, then, take as your model, judging happiness to be the fruit of freedom and freedom of valor. My task is now finished. I have performed it to the best of my ability. And now that we have brought to a close our lamentations for our relatives, let us depart. It was all over in 404 BC. Athens was defeated. Pericles, who for 31 years had led it to its destiny, swept away by the plague that followed the war's second year. Gone. Only to be echoed by the art of the centuries to follow was that dazzling eruption of genius that was the golden age. It remained for a homely little man to put a proper period on this moment in history, the philosopher Socrates. He was called the gadfly for stinging his victims with sharp inquiries, pricking their conceit and stimulating their curiosity in his search for truth. Here in the heart and marketplace of ancient Athens, whose streets he knew so well, he faced his judges in the year 399 BC on a trumped-up charge of corrupting the youth. Convicted by their votes, cast with such ballots as these, the only Athenian ever condemned for his opinion, he was given the choice of banishment or death by drinking hemlock. He chose death. But what the world knows now, they didn't know then. They could not kill Socrates. For spoken on this spot, his words, as his pupil Plato preserved them, come to us over the centuries as another treasure to match the art treasures of Greece. Truly marking for the Athenians the end of an era of creative life. And for mankind, a peak it has yet to reach again.